That was really cool. I kind of want to try that out. Everybody give me a big cheer. <laughs> wow. That power is seductive. <laughs> um, thanks for joining me today. Uh, great to see a standing room only crowd here. There must not be a lot going on this week. Um, I'm delighted to be here. You know, I've been reflecting on this whole Brexit issue um, and thinking about you know, where to find, make sense of, of the d disruption and turmoil that's going on. And, and I think that uh, there might be an answer in uh, technology because in addition to this political revolution that's kind of going on right now, we also have a technological revolution that's happening as well. And this is by far the most sophisticated crowd I think I've spoken to. So uh, everyone here is obviously familiar with all of these big technological trends that are going on. But it's our view that the technology likely to have the greatest impact on the world for the next 20 years is actually not mobility, big data, um, cloud computing, machine learning, AI, et cetera. It's the technology behind cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, and it's called the blockchain. And um, after a few years of research and, uh, and the writing for this book, we've basically become convinced that this technology represents nothing short of the second generation of the internet. So when you use the internet today to send or move or share information, you're not actually sending an, an original, you're sending a copy and you're retaining an original. And generally speaking, that's okay. In fact, it's one of the great benefits of the internet is that we have this publishing platform for the democratization of information. So all you need is a internet connection and some kind of internet enabled device and you can access Google and Wikipedia and all of these wonderful resources. Um, but when it comes to value, things like money, stocks, bonds, um, other financial assets, sending a copy is actually not a good idea. You see, if I send you $20 in payment for something, it's really important that you know that you have that $20 and I don't. Because if I could send the same $20 to every single person in this room, then that $20 becomes worthless. And the global economy collapses. And I go to jail. And these are all really bad things. So uh, it's OK to have a printing press for information, but it's not OK to have a printing press for money. And this is something that cryptographers have been trying to figure out for a very long time. It's called the double payment problem or the double spend problem. And the first iterations of digital cash were actually developed 20, 22 years ago um, by Nick Zabo, a cryptographer. There was another one too, developed by a guy named Adam Chom. And it was very close to being part of the uh, initial integration into the Netscape Navigator, but they couldn't do it because they couldn't figure out this issue. So it turns out that we need help. We need help establishing trust. We need help verifying the identity of parties in a transaction. We need help with the clearing and the settling of those transactions. And we need help with the record keeping. And what we turn to for all of those important functions of commerce online are middlemen, basically, intermediaries. And these intermediaries take different shapes and forms. You know, people are familiar, obviously, with banks. Um, but also, increasingly, from the you know, digital revolution, we've got big conglomerates, digital conglomerates, like Google, who act as, as arbiters um, in the middle of a lot of transactions online. Facebook, Uber, Apple, et cetera, but also governments, too. And generally speaking, these intermediaries do a pretty good job, but they have certain limitations. For one, many of them are very centralized. And anything that's centralized is vulnerable to hacking or to attack or to failure. And we see this with regularity, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Home Depot, Target, and including financial services firms like uh, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, and even governments like the NSA and the State Department. You know, if the NSA can't secure its systems, then who can? Um, they tax the system, especially in financial services. In the case of um, sending money overseas, for example, it can cost anywhere between 9 and 18 percent just to make a, a cross border transaction, a cross border payment, which is crazy when you think about it um, the idea of a cross border payment. Nobody ever talks about a cross border email. You know, um, and it's just data, really, when you think about value. Um, they exclude a whole bunch of people from the, from the global economy. There are two and a half billion people in the world that don't have access to financial services of any kind, and there are lots of reasons for that. Um, and they slow things down. In the case of Google, not so much, actually. They, uh, they make things fast. But in the case of the financial services industry, um, the technology systems that we run to manage things like payments and clearing and settling of transactions are actually like 30, 40 years old. The SWIFT system, uh, the automated clearinghouse system, and other types of um, settlement transaction layers uh, run mainframes from the 70s and 80s. 
and are older than most of the people in this room. So you could argue that as a result of this issue of establishing trust and identity online, that intermediaries still capture an asymmetric amount of the value of commerce, perhaps even more so than they did in the pre-digital age. So what if there were a vast global distributed platform that ran a ledger, basically like a spreadsheet that everyone could see, that didn't run on one system, one bank system, one government system, but ran on every single computer around the world, and wasn't only open to a few, but was open to everybody. Where not just information, like emails and PDFs and websites and voice over IP, uh, but literally anything of value. So of course, money and stocks and bonds and financial assets, but also titles and deeds, intellectual property, scientific discoveries, even votes in an election could be moved, stored, and managed privately and securely, and where trust was not established by an intermediary, but rather through mass collaboration, clever code, and cryptography. And I think that's what we've got with blockchain. So in 2008, the global financial system was on the brink of collapse. Everybody remembers that pretty well. Um, some of you might have been in high school, but, um, but somewhat propitiously, right around that time, an anonymous person or group of people under the uh, pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto outlined in a white paper, cash for the internet, digital cash, which is basically to say an, a way to make payments peer to peer without using an intermediary. Kind of like the way you would go down to the coffee shop and with a five quid note, pay for coffee and a donut. Uh, there's no intermediary in that transaction. That didn't really exist for the internet. We've always had to rely on intermediaries to make payments. And they launched it shortly thereafter. And since then it's you know, caught a spark that's traveled like wildfire to the world of computing, um, financial services, which is the area that I spent um, some of the formative years of my career, um, but also into business generally, media, and including government. So Bitcoin is, is many things to different people. You know, some people think of Bitcoin as an asset. It goes up, it goes down, you can buy it, you can sell it, you can make money on it. And that's certainly true. And actually it's uh, increasingly being viewed as sort of an uncorrelated asset and a, and a safe harbor in some respects. So, you know, Brexit referendum vote, uh, Bitcoin went up 20%. When the Chinese uh, People's Bank of China wants to devalue its currency, Bitcoin usually rallies. And that's interesting. Um, but more interestingly, it's a cryptocurrency, which is to say a currency that's not issued or controlled by a nation state or by a supranational organization like the European Union. And that's very interesting if you're in a part of the world where the local currency is very unreliable, where there are strict capital controls, if you're part of diasporas living abroad and you send money home, to your families and you normally pay 10%. These are all opportunities for uh, Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency. But most interestingly is it's based on this technology called the blockchain. So for the first time in human history, two or more parties need not know nor trust one another to transact or do business. Um, you've got trust rather than being the domain of the intermediary, the uh, controlling role of the intermediary. It's actually native to this technology, which is why we call uh, blockchain, the trust protocol. So people here doubtless are familiar with all of this um, stuff to some degree. And so you know full well that you know, there's the Bitcoin blockchain. There are other types of blockchains. Some are public, like Ethereum is another public blockchain. And then there are others that are not, private blockchains that are being developed by banks and, and enterprise and government and these different things. So not every blockchain looks alike, but this is generally the way they work. So it starts with a distributed ledger which is not running on one computer or one system. It's running on every single system that has access to it. Transactions that are constantly happening on the network um, are validated by a community of participants. In the case of the Bitcoin blockchain, they're called miners. Not like, like miners, miners, but like pickaxe miners, um, who commit large computing resources to solve a difficult problem, uh, after which they reach consensus, essentially, on what has occurred. And in, in reward for reaching consensus on what's occurred, they're rewarded with uh, new Bitcoin. And every so often, these transactions on the network, kind of like the heartbeat, are captured into these things called blocks. Mm -hmm. And then each block, once it's validated, must refer to the preceding block in the blockchain, and every block all the way back to the beginning of time. So what that means effectively is if I wanted to rewrite a transaction, like send the same $20 twice in the first example that I gave, I would not only have to go back and just move a number in a spreadsheet, you know, hack one transaction, I'd have to go back basically and rewrite the entire history of commerce on the blockchain all the way back to the beginning of time on the blockchain. 
and uh, do so in a very short window, fighting against the, one of the most powerful computing resources in the world. One um, blockchain startup CEO, who also was a partner at Andreessen Horowitz, estimates that the computing power that this network marshals to validate transactions is about 100 times as big as Google. So that's very big, because you guys know how big Google is. <laughs> maybe, maybe you don't. <laughs> and of course, each block is timestamped, which means any attempt to change when a transaction's occurred is sort of you know, identified and stopped. So uh, that's the way Bitcoin works, but it's open source, so it's created this sort of uh, Cambrian explosion of innovation, which has led to new uh, types of blockchains. So just a show of hands, who here has heard of Ethereum? So most of the people here. So I'm very proud of Ethereum, because it's a little Canadian success story, and I'm from Toronto, Canada. Any Canadians in the room? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we're now worried about Quebec's it. <laughs> so... <laughs> So Ethereum was started by a, a Canadian college dropout um, named Vitalik Buterin, who was a big fan of Bitcoin, but in it he saw certain limitations. He wanted to build applications, he wanted to do smart contracts, you know, uh, complicated um, tasks that he thought Bitcoin was limited in its ability to do. And so he created this thing called Ethereum. He wrote a white paper, put it on Reddit, put it on GitHub, uh, and said, you know, who wants to fund my project? And he ended up raising 19 million US dollars in a matter of four weeks to fund this project. And they basically went down and got to work. And 12 months later, Ethereum launched. And it's now worth around a billion, billion and a half US dollars. And it's being used by you know, Microsoft, Deloitte, UBS, and a whole bunch of other very big firms. Um, one of the things that it does is, is I, I mentioned smart contracts, which is kind of what they sound like. You know, a, a software program that mimics the logic of a contract but where the enforcement and the execution is done automatically, and where it also has a payment mechanism that assures everyone gets compensated regularly without the need for you know, lawyers and escrow agents and bankers and all these other kind of friction points in, uh, in traditional contracting. And we kind of suggested in the book that um, this could create whole new kinds of business models where you know, a lot of the roles that we normally reserve for people could be automated through these things called smart contracts. Who here has heard of this thing, the DAO? D-A-O. Okay, so everyone, you know that it's all good. Uh, no, pr <laughs> no problems with the DAO. It's all good. <laughs> no, so um, in the book we said there's this thing called the distributed autonomous uh, enterprises. This is what we call these companies that wouldn't have people doing normal roles. And we th at the time we thought, God, this is a little bit far out there, you know, a company without people. People are gonna think that we've drank our own Kool-Aid or that we're, you know, token up or something like that. Um, but we said, let's do it, let's put it into the book and we'll see where we get. The day the book launched, this thing called the DAO came into existence and it looked a lot like the DAE that we had uh, suggested could happen with the book. Um, you know, it has no management, it has no staff, traditional sense, it has no, you know, board of governors. It's an investment vehicle that um, was designed to make investments into the blockchain industry. And its first task was to raise some money. And in the first few weeks, it managed to raise at its peak 165 million US dollars, which just for financial services is a huge breakthrough. So forget if the DAO works or not. What does it mean when an entrepreneur, a group of entrepreneurs can basically at gain access to tens of thousands of individual investors and do a peer-to-peer -peer crowd sale without the need for VC, without the need for investment bank, without the need even for Kickstarter or an Indiegogo. $162 million is a lot of money. I mean, that's like the bread and butter for late stage VC, for um, you know, a lot of IPO markets around the world. So this is gonna have a big disruptive force on, on uh, finance. Of course, the DAO, like any good blockchain startup, has uh, problems. <laughs> Um, namely that there was a flaw in this, in this contract that enabled someone to exploit it momentarily to, to um, siphon off some money into a separate account. And that's an issue that's being resolved right now. We'll get back to that. So going back to financial services, um, does everybody know what this thing is? It's called a Rube Goldberg machine. It's the kind of thing I'd expect to find in a Google lobby, actually. <laughs> you know, guests wear like a punching, you know, a, a boxing glove and hit something and a hilarity ensues. Um, this is kind of how the financial services industry works, actually, uh, which is that you know you a whole bunch of pr complicated things happen, and in the end, a very simple task is solved, like an egg is cracked or a door is closed. 
So you know, you go to um, London just introduced um, the tap cards in the in the taxis, right? And uh, you tap your card, and you, s you feel like that's a seamless transaction, that the value might be going directly from you to the, the cab driver. But it's not. It's going through a series of intermediaries, your bank, his bank, cab company's bank, um, a processing firm, um, the Visa network, if you're using a Visa, the Amex network, if you're using an Amex, uh, and usually uh, some kind of a clearing house or some kind of system. So you're talking about half a dozen different intermediaries. And the money doesn't land immediately. It actually takes five to seven days. And it's not free. It costs. Um, usually anywhere between 2 and 10%, which is why cab drivers hate taking credit cards, right? And that's actually an efficient example of the way the financial services industry works. In the book, we identified sort of what are the eight things that this industry does in the economy to try and better understand how blockchain would impact it. And it turns out in each of these different functions, there's a big opportunity to fundamentally transform the nature of the industry. So everything from... Um, how we fund and invest, which would be, say, the DAO, how we connect entrepreneurs with investors who are prepared to give growth capital, how we access credit, how we just store and move value, et cetera. So given the potential of uh, this technology, it's no small wonder why a lot of media outlets and big stakeholders are waking up to this. So The Economist ran this cover story on blockchain in October of 2015, last year, and they said, Blockchain is not one of the most important developments of the past 20 years. They said it's one of the most important innovations of the past 200 years, along with double entry bookkeeping and the joint stock corporation, which admittedly are not the sexiest things in the world. <laughs> double entry book, no, so boring. But uh, kind of important, you know, because without double entry bookkeeping, the joint stock corporation, there'd be no Google, there'd be no skyscraper, there'd be no electricity, there'd be none of these things. The basis of the economic order. Um, so given all that, this is the conversation that's happening a lot of times in, uh, in companies, uh, increasingly from financial services, but also in government, <laughs> etc. cetera. Um, <laughs> by the way, Dilbert is usually a pretty good harbinger of um, things to come. Um, the, in 1993, they ran a, a cartoon about Unix where the boss confused Unix with Unux. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway. <laughs> so what does this mean for you and for us, and why should you care? So in the book, we, we identified sort of a half a dozen ways in which blockchain will be transformative. And uh, the one I'd like to share with you today is this idea of prosperity, which is that the internet has been a great tool, and it's changed the way we live. But um, on certain metrics, it has a bit of a, um, a mixed track record. Um, you know, on the report card for prosperity, this idea that the rising tide of technology lifts all boats, that some can succeed much more than others, you know, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, all of you, but that generally everyone gets ahead. Um, well, if you look at the big social issues in a lot of parts of the world, um, social inequality and income inequality is kind of number one in almost every OECD country, with the exception of the UK, where it's Brexit. Um, but actually, if you look at the origins of Brexit, you could argue that big social ills have exacerbated the tension which may have led to the vote. And it could also be the reason why you see this populist surge in places like France, Mary Le Pen, and in the US with Donald Trump, et cetera. So could blockchain help us to um, build a more prosperous economy, more inclusive economy? We think so. So in the book, we identify eight transformations. The first couple are really low-hanging fruit, you know? Inclusion. Two and a half billion people in the world don't have a bank account or any way to make payments or store money. And without that, their economic mobility is severely limited. They really have no way to participate fully in the global economy. And it turns out that um, the reason that banks can't really offer services to these people in addition to them not really having a balance that would justify it, is that they don't have an identity. If you don't have an identity, you can't prove who you are, then a bank's never going to service you. So they don't have a driver's license, birth certificate, et cetera. Um, blockchain startups are trying to solve this problem by not looking at it as a banking question, but looking at it as basic financial services. So when you think about what retail banks actually do, they basically give people a way to move money, which is to make payments and transfer funds, a way to store money, a way to reliably 
capture your savings somewhere where it's not stored in a pig or a cow or something like that, um, and a way to get, get access to credit, to get a loan, to buy a house, or get an education, or to start a business. And the barriers to entry for new startups in the space are dropping significantly. Um, there's a company in, in Kenya called M-Pesa, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which doesn't use blockchain. Um, it just leverages a telecom network, which everyone's got a phone, nobody has a bank account, but everyone has a phone, and it's been able to push 40% of the GDP through this system. Now, unfortunately, you want to talk too big to fail. If 40% of the GDP is moving through one company, that's a problem. And also, because it's localized to whatever their coverage is, it's, in, it's inherently limited. It's a Kenya-based thing. So what if we could do that on a global scale? Um, there's a very famous Peruvian economist named Hernando de Soto who says the biggest barrier to upward mobility is not actually financial inclusion, it's land titles. 70% of people in the world who think they, actually think they own land actually have a very unenforceable claim to it. And this plays out all over the world, the Rio Olympics. They basically evicted tens of thousands of people from favelas to build stadiums. Some of them were squatters who had been there for 50 years. Others actually had title that said they owned the land. It didn't matter. They said, actually, our government system says that we own the land and um, we're evicting you from this piece of property. Uh, it happens in places like Honduras, where the most recent president was actually ousted in a bloodless coup for doing this exact same thing. He expropriated land from peasants and said that his friends and government and his other cronies owned it. Well, now the government of Honduras is working with a blockchain company called Factum um, to try and solve these problems. And uh, it's happening in other places too. In Georgia, in Europe, they're working with a company called Bitfury. Sweden has also announced a pilot. The idea is pretty simple. Um, you need good data to start of who owns what. Because if you put garbage in, you'll get garbage out. But if you, everyone can agree on who owns what property and it goes into the system, that means that no single entity can unilaterally change who owns what. No dictator or tyrant can mess with it. Um, and it also means that um, the security of that information is, uh, is much stronger. Um, I was uh, at a blockchain conference with the former prime minister of Haiti, and he said that uh, after the earthquake, they lost all of their records because everything was stored either in paper or in a central computer system in one single building in Port-au-Prince, which collapsed. And the entire government's history of people and buildings were wiped out in one single blow. Could we use blockchain to create a true sharing economy? Um, companies like Uber and Lyft and, and TaskRabbit are par called it part of the so-called sharing economy, but we actually think they don't, don't really have that much to do with sharing. In fact, we think they're actually successful precisely because they don't share. You know, Uber is a $65 billion service aggregator that is a, acts as a centralized um, intermediary aggregating drivers and cars through a centralized um, aggregator and then pushing it out to an open market. In the process, they capture a big chunk of the fee, 20%, 25%, but they also capture all of the value. The 65 billion is the big prize, not the 20%, right? Um, so there are new ways to distribute ownership across companies, kind of similar to the Dow, where anybody with a, as little as $1 can become a shareholder. And instead of having a corporation, you could have a driver-owned cooperative, where many of the functions of what Uber does, identity, reputation, contracting, and payments, basically, that's about 80% of what they do, um, can be automated using blockchain technology and smart contracting technology. And we could actually create a true sharing economy where the creators of value get to participate more fully. $600 billion a year moves from developed countries into developing countries. It's the biggest flow of funds into the developing world, more so than direct foreign investment or foreign aid. And it costs around 10%, according to the World Bank. And it's something that directly affects some of the poorest people in the world. So in Haiti, 25% of the GDP, the whole country, is remittances. In the Philippines, which is a big country with a diverse economy, it's still 13% of the economy is just remittance um, of the GDP is remittances. So there's a housekeeper in Toronto, her name's Annalie Domingo, and for 25 years she's been sending money dutifully home to her mother in Manila. And I join her on one of these trips, so she gets her paycheck, physical paycheck from her boss, goes to the bank, deposits it, withdraws cash, gets on a bus, goes to the other side of town from where she lives, um, to a Filipino supermarket, which also is a Western Union counter. It's payday, so 50 other people have the same idea. We wait in line for an hour. She gets to the front of the line, fills out a paper form, 
the same form she's filled out every month for 25 years, and hands over physical cash. The money doesn't arrive the next day or even the two days later. It arrives five to seven days later, and it costs anywhere between 9 and 10 percent. Her mother, who's 70 in Manila, never knows when it's going to arrive, and this is a point of stress. You know, will she go and pick it up? When does she have to go and pick it up? And there's a cottage industry in places like the Philippines where stick-up artists just hang, out or hang around Western Union locations waiting for people to get cash, and then they rob them. So this is a very inefficient system and one that's unfair to um, vulnerable people. Now, Annalee um, uses a, an application called Abra, which is based out of Silicon Valley. And what it does is allows her boss or her employer to pay her directly through her bank. She's banked. She's not unbanked. Through her bank account into the uh, Abra app. She's able from there to send money to her mother in the Philippines. What they do is they use the Bitcoin blockchain basically as a payment rail to move the value from her to her mother. But her mother's 70 and she's 50 and they don't, they're not tech savvy. So what Abra's done to make it easier is that Annalie only sees Canadian dollars and her mom only sees Filipino pesos. There's no Bitcoin in this transaction. And it doesn't cost 10%, it costs a quarter of 1%. Now, mom's in the Philippines, she wants cash. She goes to the market in cash, she pays her rent in cash. So what Abra's done is put on top of it um, a teller network, sort of like Uber drivers, where someone will meet you in exchange for a fee and swap your, your, physical, your virtual for your physical pesos. And they set the price. So 2%, they got a five out of five star rating, her mom meets this person, and they swap the cash. The whole thing takes, you know, half an hour, um, and costs, you know, one and a half, two percent, rather than taking seven days and costing ten percent. They didn't quite get the proportions right on this image. I have a big head, but it's not that big. <laughs> um, one of the, the interesting things about the first generation of the internet is that the the asset class the most important asset class of this economy is data, kind of like industrial plant in the industrial age and land in the, in the agrarian age. But individuals don't own it. It's actually owned and controlled by powerful intermediaries. Google, Facebook, Apple, Uber, your banks, your governments. And that's, there are some issues with that. Um, namely, that it prevents individuals a lot of times from using it to manage their affairs or to monetize that value, and s uh, that data in some way. But also, in the most extreme cases, can lead to people, uh, people's privacy being undermined. So there are now companies that use blockchain to create a virtual you, like a personal black box, where in it you've got different shades of your identity. You know, me the citizen, me the employee, me the consumer, me the user of social media, me the um, customer of a bank. And you decide how that data gets used in each individual situation. And you only relinquish what you need to relinquish um, to gain access to a certain service. So, you know, you want to make a payment, you want to buy something? <coughs> Nobody really needs to know who you are, necessarily. You, know, you go buy a hot dog downstairs. Do they sell hot dogs <laughs> in the UK? <laughs> yeah. You go down to get, like, a scone <laughs> from, <laughs> from the scone stand, <laughs> you know. The guy running the scone stand doesn't ask for your driver's license. He just wants to know that you've got the money for the scone and the jam and the cl clotted cream. Um, so there's an opportunity here to, to change the relationship um, that people have with who they interact with. Now, it's actually not necessarily a negative for companies like Google. Um, you know, you guys love data, big data. Um, but maybe you could get even more data if you ensured that consumers kind of got a cut of the value. You know, they, instead of being just passive recipients of your services, they were prosumers. They were giving you information that was valuable to you and in exchange getting some kind of value other than the brilliant, amazing, free uh, utility that is Google. Um, could we ensure that artists get, uh, get compensated fairly for um, the content that they create? Does everyone, does it, who knows Imogen Heap here? She's English. I'm very disappointed in the rest of you. So artists have always had a bad deal, um, ever since the days of Medici, really. Um, and during the record label era, they fought for a few percent uh, royalties on every single song that they released. And through the internet era, um, which was supposed to solve this to a certain degree, to put more power in the individual's hands and less reliance on intermediaries, it actually made things worse. Because music, which was an asset, turned into a free commodity which could be duplicated and shared with everyone. And so a new set of intermediaries stepped in to try and solve this. Apple with digital downloads and now Spotify. 
with streaming, but it's only gotten worse for artists. So if you were a songwriter on a hit single in the 80s and it sold a million copies, you would get about $45,000. The same song today, if it's streamed a million times on Spotify, the artist can expect, the songwriter can expect 36 bucks. So 45,000 to 36, which in London doesn't get you very far. <laughs> I've, I've tried over the past couple days. Um, so that's a, that is, you know, there's something's got to give kind of feeling to it, right? So now artists are looking for a way to put more control into uh, the hands of creators. So Imogen Heap has a startup in London called Mycelia, which takes the song, which is normally just music, and gives it intelligence. So within the song are licensing rights and royalty rights built in. So whenever the song's consumed, let's say it's streamed, uh, and it's you know, a half of a cent, that half of a cent will get split immediately amongst whoever has the royalties on that song, the artists, producers, etc. But if it's downloaded for a dollar, um, the royalty regime might be the same, but the licensing is different, so it's a buck. And if it's played in a TV commercial, it's a different licensing regime. If it's played, <coughs> if it's sampled for a ringtone, it's a different one. But every time it's consumed, however it's consumed, the value moves directly from whoever's paying directly to the artist, rather than going through this system of intermediaries. So that assures that artists get paid first. It doesn't solve the you can duplicate music issue, but it, if the pie is shrinking, it just makes sure that more of the smaller pie is going to the people who actually deserve it. So in the book, um, that's an example of what we call the metering economy, which is that we have all this value, you know, our data, uh, maybe an autonomous vehicle not too far down the road, which we should be able to meter out to the world uh, and receive value for it. Maybe it's a solar panel on the roof of your house. This is an example of what NASDAQ is doing. Uh, NASDAQ we think of as a market, you know, a market maker or a technology provider to, to markets and stocks and bonds and other financial assets. They view themselves as a technology firm whose core competency is markets. So what could blockchain do to expand the idea of markets to other types of asset classes? One of them is electricity. So they're working right now with a distributed power company in, in uh, Silicon Valley where if you've got a panel on your roof and you generate power in excess of what you need, you can sell it not into the grid at a wholesale rate to the utility, but rather peer-to-peer -to, -peer to your neighbor or someone on the other side of town at a market rate, a retail rate, and you can create much more value for yourselves. What NASDAQ's doing is allowing you to basically bundle kilowatt hours into assets that can be traded like stocks across a marketplace peer-to-peer, -peer, I think is fascinating. This is a guy named Ronald Coase, um, among other things, I'd like to know what he ate for breakfast every day, because he lived till he was 103. Um, but he basically said, asked a very simple question. He said, why do we have firms? Why are there corporations? If the best way to allocate resources and organize capability um, is using a market, uh, you know, Adam Smith, free market, then why isn't everyone an independent contractor? How come all of you work for Google and you're not all transacting with each other peer to peer? In, in your respective roles. And he pointed to one specific thing. He said transaction costs. And he won a Nobel Prize for saying this. So long as it's cheaper to do things inside the boundaries of the firm than outside, then firms will continue to grow. And he pointed specifically to the cost of search, coordination, contracting, and establishing trust. So Henry Ford knew this, which is why the Ford Motor Company had not just a, um, a uh, car plant, but it had a rubber plantation, a timber mill, a steel plant, um, because he, he knew that keeping everything, everything inside the firm would be cheaper through economies of scale. Um, the internet changed that somewhat, unbundling certain things from the firm so we can rely increasingly on offshoring and outsourcing because we have communication tools that allow us to connect over long distances. Um, you know, the motto, do what you do, focus on what you do best, outsource the rest, came out in the 90s, right around the internet era. Uh, but now we think there are new models where you can have r radically distributed modes of production where, as I mentioned, you can kind of begin to unbundle the vertically integrated firms because you don't need, everyone doesn't need to know each other to build value because we've got a technology that establishes trust. Um, people don't need to, you know, do everything inside of a firm, organized capability because we can contract pretty seamlessly for relatively little cost through smart contracts. Um, and, you know, things like search, if you have a record of everything and you know it's true because it's immutable, then you're able to find valuable information that you know is, is valid much more easily. And in the book, we talk about new business models 
specifically the distributed autonomous enterprise, which is highly automated and, and complex and uses this technology. So to conclude on the transformations, let's talk about government, because I think this is a very topical um, thing <laughs> right now. These two books um, came out when I was a kid, um, 92 and 93, Reinventing Government and the Gore Report on Reinventing Government. And in it they said, we can bring the tonic of the market to bear on government, we can do government better, faster, cheaper, we can use digital technology to transform the relationship between government and citizens. And you look back on government, how it's changed or how it has not changed over the past 25 years. And I think at best what we've done is just paved the cow path. We've taken stuff that we did in the pre-digital age and kind of made it digital without actually changing the underlying nature of government. And that, among other things, is causing a real rift, I think, between governments and citizens, where I think a lot of people don't feel like their government acts in their best interest, and where they feel like they're being left behind. And this is playing out all over the world in various different forms. So what could blockchain do to, A, restore legitimacy in government institutions, and B, just improve the way that government delivers services to people? Well, on the first point, right now, especially in the US, politicians are not beholden to citizens, they're beholden to powerful interests that help to get them elected, basically. 92% of people in the US believe there should be a background check on firearms, according to a poll that came out a week ago. Congress cannot pass a law that reflects the will of the people because they are captured by these powerful forces. So why would you have any faith in government when it can't do anything um, to reflect the will of the people? Well imagine if a politician got elected with a smart contract that stipulated that they actually had to abide by their commitments, otherwise they wouldn't get paid. or maybe a little less severe, they don't get the appropriations to pay for the projects they want to pay for unless they actually hit milestones that have been predetermined based on the view of the electorate. The goal is not to create direct democracy. The re referendum last week should told us that that's a bad idea. <laughs> um, but it is to, to help uh, empower individuals to have more active role in government, which I think is healthy <coughs> within the context of you know, democratic institutions. In terms of delivering services, well, gee, it would be a lot easier if you could um, procure taxes and pay out benefits peer-to-peer um, -peer without having to rely on all the paper and, and intermediaries that we traditionally rely on. That's kind of low-hanging fruit, and, and a lot of governments have said that. The Bank of England, um, the Canadian Senate came out with a report saying that just the pure delivery of services could be done a lot easier. So there's an opportunity for government as well. So I'm bullish, obviously, on all of this stuff, um, but I don't believe that it's going to happen on its own. Um, technology is not you know, a solution to the world's problems, and uh, blockchain is certainly not a panacea. In fact, in the book, we identify um, there are so many things that have to go right for this to, to actually reach its potential. We dedicated a whole chapter to the things that could go wrong um, in the Showstoppers chapter. Everything from can this technology really meet the demands that we're, we expect of it? You know, can it animate the Internet of Things or be the backbone of financial services or digital rights management? That's a big question. Um, is the energy consumed unsustainable? It takes a lot of energy to secure a network of that size. It, could that be its ultimate downfall? Um, there are social issues like what happens if vast automation um, causes structural unemployment and puts people out of work? Uh, what happens if governments try to control it or stifle it? Um, that can happen anywhere, really, but especially in places like China and Russia and Iran. Um, could powerful forces um, end up just usurping it, controlling it, and preventing this peer-to-peer -peer promise that, that we expect? And uh, they're all significant challenges, but in the book we, we asked ourselves, is it a reason that blockchain's a bad idea, or is it an implementation challenge that, that deserves to be addressed and overcome because the opportunity is significant? And for each of these, we went with the latter. It's, um, it's an implementation challenge. So it's one of those things where um, we're at the brink of a new era, we think. The technology genie has been unleashed from the bottle. At our disposal, once again, 
to transform the economic power grid, the old order of human affairs, and maybe, if we get this right, to build a more fair and inclusive and, and prosperous world. But it won't happen on its own. We need leadership. I don't need to tell you about leadership. You know, everyone's self-selected by being here. You're all rock stars who work at Google. Um, leadership usually doesn't come from the CEO level or the president level or the prime minister level. Uh, it comes from just about anywhere. So I encourage you to um, read the book, um, to treat this as the first step on a long journey. Um, this technology, I think, will come to play a big part in a lot of your lives. So um, join the revolution, as we say. So thank you very much. So we have some time for questions. Uh, yeah. What do you think will be the killer application that breaks through in kind of the Western world, do you think? Because we don't do the money transfer in the same way. Yeah. Do you think there's an application where my mum and dad will start using it, for example, even if it's in the background? Well, I think the, the second point of that question is great, which is that in a lot of ways, I think people will use this technology without actually realizing that they're using the technology. So maybe your mum and dad um, listen to music or they read the newspaper online, right? And they might not know this, but um, what's happening in the background is that the articles that they're reading are creating microtransactions that directly compensate the journalist. Um, rather than having to pay a subscription model, they might pay a micro fee model. Same thing could apply for music. Um, when they go to the bank, they maybe they, they use um, internet banking, for example, or mobile banking. Um, when they go to make a payment, they won't have to take a photograph of a check in order to send the money in which they might do, they might not, um, because there's a way to do that transaction sort of peer to peer. Right now, you take a picture of a check, it, it has 130 touch points before it actually settles. It goes through 130 different sort of systems. Um, within government, democracy, maybe they're deliberative polling. Maybe your mom and dad, you know, prior to the Brexit vote, um, wanted to, um, you know, participate in a poll where the results were not just tabulated by some polling company, but rather accrued to a blockchain, which gave everyone a very accurate representation of what everyone thought, um, which could have maybe swayed the vote one way or the other. So that's just a few off the top of my head. And do you see a time scale where that we might see that happening? Two, five years sooner? Yeah, well, you know, um, I view the future as not something to be predicted, rather something to be achieved, uh, which might sound like a cop-out of the question. But uh, I think we'll start seeing big changes in the, the deep architecture of financial services within a year or two, and then more broadly within the next five years. Great. Yeah. So I worked for a bank for 14 years, and we, I always work like 10 years in the past. How do you think this kind of revolution will come to banks, to big banks? Do you think they will like lose to the small guy that will become bigger using this, and then they'll, when they see, oh, no, oh I, we don't have chance anymore, then they break and there's a new guy that is, came from this technology. Or do you think there is a chance of they start using this somehow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, when I started the research on this about two and a half years ago, no bank had expressed any real interest in this. And even big consulting firms, when I asked them, like, what are your big bank clients saying, they're like, well, it's kind of interesting, we're not, we're not really keen on it. Um, now, today, every single bank in the world has either made a pronouncement that they're doing stuff, or they're actually like heavily invested in this technology. But not all banks are equal. And I think, generally speaking, they fit into th three different categories. So category one are the ones who don't really understand what it is or what it could mean, but they know that it's a big deal, and so they're, f they're kind of afraid of what it means to the business, and they're trying to learn more. Um, increasingly, more banks fit into category two, which is they're viewing this as a huge opportunity, namely to cut cost out of the existing business. Because if, if, you if you're a market maker in a kind of stock or a bond, whatever it is, and you can assure that settlement and clearing happens instantly, you don't have to pay for clearing houses and transfer agents and escrow agents and all these different intermediaries that add friction to your business. So Santander, uh, which is a big bank, said that just from public equity clearing and settling, banks could cut $20 billion of cost. Um, and obviously banks do a lot more than just public equity clearing and settling. So that's a logical perspective for a bank to have. You know, if you're a bank today, you're thinking global growth is slowing down, the regulatory cost of business is increasing, and there's more competition from fintech companies. All of that combined basically means my revenue is probably not going to grow very much. So how do I drive return on equity? How do I drive share, my share price? The only way is to cut cost. 
So if they can cut costs from their business by using this technology, uh, then they're happy. And we're seeing lots of implementations that try and do that. Um, R3 is a big consortium of 50 banks based out of the US. Hyperledger is a project being run by IBM that has a dozen or so banks is signed up. Uh, there's a company, Digital Asset Holdings, which was started by the former head of J.P. Morgan's investment bank, Blythe Masters, um, which is servicing stock exchanges and big banks. Um, and they're trying to capture that side of the market. However, there is a third category, and this is where I think most banks and incumbents generally, whatever industry you're in, should be more focused on, which is to look at it strategically. Because what good is cutting $20 billion from public equity trading when the process by which value moves and, and gets exchanged no longer becomes something that banks do at all? You know, what if that market disappears? You can't cut $20 billion from a market that doesn't exist, right? So to think about it strategically is to say, maybe I might lose out in areas where I've traditionally acted as this intermediary and arbiter, but could this technology create new opportunities? So like NASDAQ's move with this distributed power grid, I think is a good example of that. Um, you know, someone's got to go after two and a half billion people in the world that don't have access to banking. Someone's got to figure out this remittance ripoff. And right now, the only companies really that I think are focused on big growth are actually, as you mentioned, startups, new companies that are trying to solve these, uh, these intractable problems that have nothing to do with cutting costs. They have everything to do with transforming the industry. So. Hi there. My name Hi. is Alfred. Thanks very much. It's really informative. Um, and uh, you've sold me. You know, right? You sold it to me. I'm happy with this. I want to want to join the bandwagon. You're already wearing a red shirt. So join the revolution. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so the question is, me as a mere mortal, how? How do I contribute to this? How do I get involved? Do you work, is at, it, do you work at Google? I, I, I do, yes. You are not a mere mortal. <laughs> <laughs> You're a superhero, right? Um, how do you get involved in this? Well, I think the, the, the one thing that everybody can do is to go to the App Store, download a wallet, buy some Bitcoin, and just start like fiddling around with paying with Bitcoin, uh, moving Bitcoin. Because you know, we can talk about how the technology works till the cows come home, but you just use it, do it, um, you'll, you'll instantly get it, right? And that'll just help you with your understanding. Um, more broadly, you know, I would think about how this technology could apply to whatever business that you might be in, right? So um, Google, I don't want to get out of my depth because you guys are all experts. But you know, if you could target consumers better with advertising, that's something that you would explore, right? Um, maybe you can mine data that people volunteer, and you can sign people up as co-producers of, of you know, Google content. And um, you could solve some big issues in that way. Um, another way, like I, the one specific Google example that I actually think about is YouTube. So the digital rights management for people who post content to YouTube is a total nightmare. You know, um, like there are accounts at Google where money just accrues because you run ads in front of a, a show or a song, but nobody knows who owns it. And eventually, I think you just keep it for yourself. Um, so maybe you don't want to change that. <laughs> but, but it would be, you know, con people who create content would be a lot happier with YouTube if they were able to get paid directly every time someone comes content and if you had a DRM system that used this technology. Now a lot of labels and tech firms are working on this, but the, num the place where people consume music the most in the world, it's not Spotify or Apple, it's YouTube, right? So why not be a leader in figuring that out, something like that? Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much, it's really interesting. Um, this is an old world meets new world question and um, excuse my ignorance, but what is the impact on privacy and confidentiality as it relates to the original asset, the original value of the asset or service? So, uh, and also as it relates to margin that's applied on that um, through, value, through added value services, like you mentioned, the, the cash payment of 2% mm -hmm. uh, margin or the 0.25%. So I, what's the impact if that is clear throughout the whole chain of, of the transaction? Mm -hmm. So this, the, the systems um, are transparent in that you can see that money is moving and that value is moving, but you can't see who's moving that value. So you can see with clarity you know, whether or not a transaction occurred and whether or not someone got paid, but you don't necessarily know who that person is or who the sender is. Um, so that obfuscates the, the individual's identity, which in a lot of situations is a very good thing. Um, the, the, the other question though that's really interesting that you mentioned is, um, the origination, right, of the, of the asset and how do you secure 
you know, privacy for whatever that asset is. Um, and this is an, an interesting point for the financial services industry. We have Bitcoin, we have Ether, these are public blockchains, but you know, if, if, if all financial assets like stocks and bonds are going to move onto this platform, someone's got to issue them. Maybe it's the Bank of England issues a digital pound, um, or Apple issues a digital share certificate using this technology, but someone's got to issue them. So the, the, <coughs> the, the interesting thing there is that you know, intermediaries are not going away. Maybe intermediaries just change their name to originators because someone's got to start building like this platform, or rather um, moving assets into a, digital, a native digital format. And actually I think that's a big opportunity for big financial firms um, <coughs> to do, essentially. So they're not going away, banks are not going away. Great, let's try and get two or three quick ones in, maybe in the back. Yeah, sorry, I'll do a lightning round. You recently touched on the um, <laughs> event that happened at the DAO, yeah. or DAO. Um, and I, I just want to kind of say, you know, I'm pro blockchain and um, I just want, I just wondered how you think that event is going to change people's perceptions, um, especially when you refer to the technology that establishes trust. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is there an element that people are being a little bit too utopian at this stage mm -hmm. about what the blockchain is and how it works? Yeah. So on the utopian side, yes. Um, for in terms of the hype cycle, we're starting to heat up quite a bit here, and now people are saying blockchain is the solution to all of you know, whatever ails you. And that's not a good thing, generally. People eventually realize that it's not, and that causes uh, disillusionment. But on the question of the DAO specifically, um, this is a question of, of communication and perception. Because Ethereum, which is the blockchain on which the DAO is built, was not hacked. So there's nothing about the immutability or security of the platform that's been put into question. Basically, an organize a company, an organization that uses the technology um, was breached. And new information is coming out on this every day, so we may actually find out that it was one of the original developers who built a hack, built a loophole into this thing so that he could hack it. Um, we don't know. Um, but I don't think that, I think the DAO will be a great case in, use case on how do you govern an, a, an asset that doesn't owned by a company or controlled by a government. You know, how do you resolve these issues when you're kind of outside of the court system and outside of, you know, the corporate world? And that'll be really interesting. Um, my view on whether or not it will impact growth and development in the industry is that it probably will not. Um, things will continue to move along. Um, stuff happens. Lots of startups fail, let alone startups that have radically new business models, let alone startups that don't have people. So this is, I think that in five years' time, the mysterious case of the Dow will be a Harvard Business School you know, case study on just how the hell you deal with something like this. But I don't think it will impact the growth of, of the industry. So if I can come back to the privacy question from a different angle, I think we might have different backgrounds on this. Um, an awful lot of sort of investigative work in terms of the criminality, which you alluded to earlier, yeah. is, is following the money. Are we just gonna have to accept that we can't follow the money anymore in the new world? Well, actually, I think that it helps you to follow the money much better. Um, Two and a half trillion dollars a year of crime is done with cash. And cash is the ultimate bearer instrument. You know, it's a paper bill. You can't trace back cash. Um, it's harder to track payments made in Bitcoin than it is to say, to say, you know, visa payments or something. But it's a lot easier than it is with cash. And because you have this unbroken record of where money is moved, generally speaking, you combine that with other policing, and you can actually stop crime uh, much easier than you can with cash. Which is why, you know, like Mark Carney in his in his Mansion House speech uh, last two weeks ago said that this could help to reduce crime um, because the less cash there is in the system, the, me the less opportunities there are for criminals. But also, um, after the MT Gox, Mt. Gox, and, and the Silk Road issues, um, law enforcement agents in the US began to call Bitcoin prosecution futures because you could actually kind of identify <laughs> down the road when you, could s when you could catch someone based on when the transaction occurred. So it'll require us to, it, not to say the criminals won't use it, you know, malware happens now increasingly with Bitcoin, more so than any other payment method. Um, and that'll be an issue. But it's actually a superior alternative. And I think if law enforcement's engaged and intelligent on the issue, it could be a tool for them as well. So I was emailed a question ahead of time, which I promised I would ask, perhaps a more technical one. Can you ask about, can I ask about how Bitcoin is decentralized versus distributed? It seems, my reading of it seems to show that it may be decentralized, but isn't distributed in any meaningful way, and that that makes it a less scalable technology. 
So how is Bitcoin distributed versus decentralized and what are the implications for that? A great question. And it's at the heart of the governance issue that's happening in the Bitcoin world right now, which is um, there, there's a fight about how big the block size should be. So the, basically, the bigger the block size, the more transactions you can put in it, the more scalable the network is. But the bigger the block size, the bigger the computer systems you need to, to manage the, the, um, the blockchain, which means increasingly power will, will concentrate into the hands of huge mining pools. And um, it is a good question because I don't view Bitcoin specifically as fully distributed because most of the compute power that helps to support this network are in the hands of a dozen or so um, big mining pools that control a lot of the uh, validation on the network. Um, there are all sorts of really interesting technical solutions that are being proposed and, and implemented that could try and resolve this. Uh, there's a company in, uh, in Silicon Valley called 21 Inc. Um, which basically says, if, if everybody's a node on this network, like you know, your, your Android cell phone has a chip in it that also acts as a miner, then we can help to um, redistribute sort of the computing power away from these mining pools. Others are saying um, you can have a routing network in the Bitcoin network that allows transactions to you know, only use a few nodes rather than having to use everyone, and that could help with this issue as well. But these are they're, they're questions that to this day remain unsolved. Uh, and they go into the implementation challenge bucket. Please join me in a massive round of applause. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Thank you.